Hello, everybody. I'm Dirk Holemans. I'm co-president of the Green European Foundation and coordinator of think tank Oikos. Welcome to the start of this second series of the Green Post Corona Talks. We start with them in late April, when you remember Europe was undergoing the first lockdown. And the only news filtering through was about the rapid spread of the virus all through the continent. The world was in a kind of standstill. Some months later, in some parts of Europe, let's say the beginning of summer, it seemed that we were going to some kind of normality. But now, mid-November, we find ourselves back to square one. Again, the future is uncertain. Of course, the news about the vaccines is great, but the coming months still will be very difficult. In April, May and June, we discussed with experts and members of the Green family different aspects of the post-corona world. But the virus is still here and the band aid measures adopted hastily in spring already show their weaknesses. Of course, much has happened and the European Union has come together to prepare a common recovery plan, a discussion in which the Greens took part, calling for just sustainable and resilient recovery. So, as we know this week, uh, the European Union has a common recovery plan and should agree on its long-term budget after length lengthy negotiations. But of course, uh, today I have to mention the veto by Hungary and Poland on as well the multi-annual financial framework as the Corona Recovery Fund. This veto because of the rule of law sanction mechanism connected to it. I think the overall question today in the European Union is, as it's only now starting to draft a health policy and has faced opposition to build further its social pillar, what will come the next months? Do we go back to business or are the European leaders really delivering a kind of unprecedented policy? Uh, we know that a lot of member states' immediate response was to turn inwards, failing to display the European value of solidarity. So. Will there be room for European values in the post-corona world? Now that most seem to have knowledge that the virus is not going anywhere yet, what will the coming months of, you, of this European mandate look like? How will the political priorities shift? For discussing this today, we have two inspiring speakers. I welcome uh, Jane Lambert, European Green Party committee member and former member of the European Parliament for the Green Party of England and Wales. And I also welcome Philippe Lamberts, co-president of the Greens AFA group in the European Parliament. Both will have around 10 minutes for first intervention, followed by a Q&A. So I want to invite all of you to put your questions so we can really have a lively debate. Uh, there are many things on the table uh, concerning the European policy. And so there are many points you could start a discussion on. I first want to give the floor to Jean Lambert, as I said, uh, committee member of the European Green Party. So Jean, from the perspective of the European Green Party, how is the European Un Union dealing with uh, yeah, the challenges in these Corona times, which of course are more than just uh, challenges posed by the virus. We still have a climate crisis. We still have rising inequality. Remembering to unmute myself, you know, part of the new vocabulary of um, of COVID. Well, I think that in in terms of where we're at, where we're going within um, Europe, Europe as a whole, European Union in particular, I think you know it's very very clear that there's still um, a lot of stabilising to do and and a lot of really looking at. And exactly what is it we want to come we want to come out of, of this. That it's very, very clear that you know a lot of the measures that were put in place in the to begin with, you, you know, were stopgap measures. How are we now going to manage um a situation where even you know the news, as you said, about the vaccine is very good, it's it's very positive, but that's not tomorrow. And there are all of the issues about you know, safety, rollout of that, um, what the implications are, how long it lasts, and what are the changes that that we've made that will still have to stay in place? Because, you know, 
um, there is still that that real issue about about COVID itself. So I think that we're at a sort of stock taking moment. But one of the things that I think is clear that for a lot of the European public, they weren't necessarily that happy with what Europe was before the COVID crisis. And that the idea that we come out of it and we just go back to what we were doing before really isn't acceptable. And I was in listening to a webinar this morning. Um, it, you know, one of the things we're talking about in terms of climate change was how attitudes towards climate change in the UK, for example, have changed over the period of, of COVID. And that, um, you, you know, people have come to realise that, you know, they see it as more important than they did a few months ago. That might be because that initial panic is over, but it's also, I think, quite encouraging that this is what people are seeing, that some of the things that, that happened and ex were experienced during um, the, the first days of the COVID crisis are now sort of working through a, a feeling about the importance of green space, the importance of uh, uh, for mental health. I mean, I think that that's a potential ticking time bomb that we're we're looking at across the European Union, what this has done and is doing to people's mental health. But the importance of green space, um, the importance of civil society, the need to think about a different sort of mobility. And I think there's a challenge here for Greens because public transport has been a big way forward for us. But OK, now if people are wary about public transport, the initiatives that we're seeing about bringing forward space for walking for cycling those are sort of initiatives um you know there's space for those people understand that and they understand for example the importance what clear air feels like and that they don't want to go back to the pollution that they were experiencing before so there's a you know there are those sort of very direct experiences on the other hand what we do need to see from government um and i think that working through into the European Union is a lot about the social damage that COVID has done, that we've seen it widen the cracks that were already there with, within our societies. We've seen that, for example, the digital divide is really, really sort of um, basic to now, to actually fixing things for, for people, for giving people young people access, for example, to education, if schools are shut or if they're having to self-isolate, you know, if you're competing in a family for the one digital mechanism that you might have or you don't have digital access, you know, your education goes, your access to benefits goes, your access in a lot of places to actually being able to afford, um, you know, to have food delivered, medicines delivered, all these sorts of things. The, the digital divide is something now which, you know, it's obvious that that has to be addressed and very, very fast. And the, uh, the issues too about the different sorts of contracts that were already of concern at the European Union level at the end of the last mandate when, when I left the European Parliament. You know, how did you deal with um, zero hours contracts, informal contracts, the need for people to actually have a firm contractual basis for their work and how that then plays through into access to benefits, access to government support becomes important. We're also seeing that a number of the sectors that were recognised as unloved and indeed, you, you know, lacking investment um, whether that was the care sector, whether the food sector in terms of particularly of seasonal work, working conditions, um, a number of those areas, jobs that were very much at the bottom of the scale in some people's view, we've now recognised are absolutely essential to keep our societies functioning. But if people are being paid by the hour, if they're working on a casual basis, how do they access social security, what's the security mechanism? And therefore, part of it is the element of contract that allows you in and the challenges to the social security systems. So there's a whole set of things there where if you're looking at what's going to come forward through the social pillar, for example, um, it can't just be, it has to be about contract. 
um, it has to be issues around health and safety at work. Um, and a need, I think, for a revision of some of that and the implementation and the policing of um, a lot of the rules that already exist. It has to look at, um, you know, picking up some of the things that we've seen in the crisis, that the investment in social services in the public sector is crucial, that we can find a way to take homeless people off the streets. And what we need to do now is put in the investment to make sure that they don't go back. And so the social pillar can do quite a lot of that. It doesn't have to do it all through legislation. It can't. The competencies aren't there in some places. But there's a lot that can be done through funding, a lot that can be done through the open method of coordination, a lot that can be done from learning from each other. And I think that if we're looking at the future of Europe within this, part of what we, we need to see is that member states actually work together to learn from each other and see what is working and what they need to do to strengthen those social structures. There's a democratic challenge. You mentioned earlier on the rule of law. Um, we've seen during the crisis some governments um, gain that system to try and close the democratic space for parliaments, for opposition, whether that's Hungary cutting the amount of money that goes to opposition political parties, to mayors leading um, in cities which are not government cities. We've seen that sort of thing. The European Parliament has just done a very big report on that, on the issues around democracy, um, civil liberties. So we need to make sure that we keep that space open. And that's certainly something very important for the EGP. We've got our next council meeting. It was due to be in Poland. Um, OK, it will be Poland online. There will still be a strong influence of what we're learning from Poland. But that need to, you, you know, to ensure that the rule of law that is there, access for civil society, which has been difficult. Um, a lot of the informal methods that were used for civil society to get contacts with parliamentarians, members of the European Parliament are no longer there or not as active. So how does civil society stay in the game? And how do we make sure as well that civil liberties are not being, um, you know, sort of infringed upon more than is absolutely unnecessary and proportionate in this system? So I think, you know, there's work there. As I say, the European Parliament has been looking at that. That's something as well, which is important for the EGP. And of course, what we do as well to make sure that we're coming out of this crisis or mo still moving with the crisis in a way which still answers those very deep questions about climate change and our relationship with nature and biodiversity and to keep that on track and therefore, you know, the work on the just transition, um, where we've seen that coming in, the climate law, we can criticise quite a lot of that as not being ambitious enough. We're trying to work with, obviously, with the you know, Green Group in the European Parliament. We're trying to cooperate there to make sure that Greens in government are working as, you know, as coherently as possible to make sure that we get a strong climate law, we get that strong framing and the strong ambition so that we're then seeing just transition come through in a way which works for the climate, but it also takes into account the elements of democracy, that this is a project in which people have to be engaged and which also has to answer those social needs. So a lot of the framework is there, I think, at the moment from the European Union. And speaking from my Brexit experience, I think it's now important to make sure that everybody however critical we are about the ambition of the European Union, try doing, imagining doing all of this just at a member state level without that framework, which actually at least tries to keep Europe or a big part of Europe moving in the same direction and still active on the international stage. So the, the funding issue, I think, is the really critical one that we now have to to work with and it interests me obviously how guilty certain governments feel 
that they feel threatened by a rule of law mechanism. You know, if there was no problem, the rule of law mechanism would not be a problem for you, would it? So, you, you know, to, to make sure that that money can be unlocked, that we can really make those policies that are there work as, as strongly and as in the best interests of people and planet as, as we can. I mean, maybe we can get into being more specific within the, the questions. And, you know, but generally, you know, our feeling is along with the, the Green Group, the level of ambition needs to be bigger. We need to make sure this is a change that really rolls through. Um, how can we work best together to actually make sure that that happens and that we come, we move forward, having learned the lessons that we're learning in this crisis to make sure that we have a more resilient society, a more resilient economy and you know, an environment that's not in pieces. I'll leave it there. Yeah, this new vocabulary, as you said, you have to unmute yourself. So thank you very much for these first uh, comments with this interesting double lens, uh, being critical what's happening at the level of the European Union, but also from a UK uh, lens uh, defending the US institution uh, for taking care of uh, a common policy. Philip, you are, let's say, in the heart of the debate at the European Parliament. There is now a common recovery plan. We have a seven years budget ahead. Has, is this an adequate answer to the challenges facing now the EU? Or do you say we are not really performing well? Well, uh, hello, moment? Dirk. Hello, Jean. Uh, uh, I'll uh, answer your question. But let me first uh, pursue on the line that, uh, that uh, Jean started on. Indeed, uh, the pandemic has made a bad situation worse. Uh, it has made it certain in terms of social inequality. I mean, it's not the same thing to be confined when you have a big house uh, with uh, each kid having his own uh, uh, sleeping room and uh, many computers from which they can uh, connect to their ho home. Or when you live with uh, eight people in a small apartment and where basically uh, telework, you can just forget about this. So, uh, you know, housing inequalities, income inequalities, contract inequalities, they've, they've been, well, made even worse by the pandemic. But likewise, what is also interesting is that economic inequalities between enterprises have, be, have been made worse. I mean, we see the whole debate between sh small shop owners, small companies, and the giants of the web. And of course, when you close down uh, 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 the Carrefour of this world, but also the local bookstores, uh, there's only one winner, and that's Amazon. Uh, it's also uh, under the, the guise of uh, now uh, health security, uh, it has uh, brought forward uh, surveillance capitalism and surveillance society. Uh, and this is all to the point that uh, you can watch, and, and those uh, who are watching this, who, have, uh, who are French speakers, may have seen uh, this uh, instant success called Hold Up, which is this almost three hours uh, 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 so-called documentary on the crisis. Uh, it's so bad that actually now you have people uh, saying that this was all part of a plan, basically to uh, anchor the dominance of the happy few on the rest of society. So, I mean, a conspiracy, a conspiracy theories who, who were already right before uh, are, are becoming worse. So that shows you that I would say we Democrats, we Greens, uh, uh, well, all those of us who aspire to a more just, more sustainable, more democratic society are skating on thin ice. But the ice is still holding. That is what I find interesting. I mean. If the ice weren't holding, I mean, uh, Biden would not be uh, would have been uh, not been elected in the U.S., and uh, we would uh, see the national populist winning across the board. This is not the case at the moment, so there is no room for complacency. But it's not the case for the moment because the national populists have managed this crisis very poorly. So there's still a possibility for the other branch of the alternative to neoliberalism to flourish, and that's the one that, uh, that we are pushing. So how are we doing? Uh, have the lessons been learned? Well, actually, we're still in the midst of the pandemic, so it's hard to say, okay, 
we are talking about a post-pandemic world, uh, we are still not out of the woods, and we get con contrasting signals. We get contrasting signals because, indeed, uh, on the one hand, you have a, a common agricultural policy uh, 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 which is bound to be a remnant of the 20th productivist century, uh, which has found a majority in Parliament and Council. So that smells like, well, uh, let's not change a losing team, you know, or a losing formula. Uh, so uh, if you look at that, you feel, well, no, there's no change. If you look at, uh, at the, the capture of democracy by the executive branch, which was already underway in many member states, not just, you know, Hungary and Poland. Look at uh, the power grab of uh, the executive in France, uh, uh, but also many other countries. This uh, has been made worse. So you might say, well, it doesn't get any better. But then on the other hand, you have uh, surprising developments. The first one was actually announced before the pandemic and one could have thought that he would fall victim, and we discussed about that in the previous uh, uh, webinar, uh, fall victim to the pandemic, and it didn't, and that's European Green Deal. And so, of course, there's many reasons to criticize the European Green Deal for being too little, uh, not consistent enough, and all the rest of it. Yet, can you imagine uh, the European Commission under Jean-Claude Juncker, under José Manuel Barroso, under uh, all their predecessors, including uh, uh, Jacques Delors, proposing a European Green Deal? No, of course not. Of course not. And this seems to be real. I mean, uh, uh, it's not just trying to greenwash current policies. It's about shifting policies, shifting priorities. And indeed, the cap is a remnant of the Juncker Commission, and it fell, uh, well, it managed to get approved, uh, well, not yet, because, well, Parliament and Council have yet to agree, but the compromise between two bad versions cannot be a good version. Uh, so, uh, so that remnant of the legacy of the past uh, seems to make it through, yet uh, the, the budget proposal by the European Commission uh, is changing. And, and you know, uh, we, we finished the discussions, and as you pointed, Dirk, uh, there's an agreement between Parliament and Council but actually, that agreement is being held up by two rogue member states, and these are Hungary and Poland. And as uh, as you said, uh, uh, Jean, well, if they hold it, if they hold it up, it's probably because they know that uh, they are not really compliant in terms of respect of rule of law and uh, civil liberties. So, um, so we have an agreement that says uh, we should spend 30 percent of the budget and the recovery fund on fighting climate change. We should spend, by the end of the term, and actually earlier than that, 10% of the budget on fighting the loss of biodiversity. And by the way, the other part of the budget that is not concerned by the, those 30 or 10% should do no harm to those targets. And that is completely new. And these would be legally binding, by the way. It's not just decorative. It's legally binding. So you, you, you feel there's a change there. You feel also that uh, European Commission that was mercantilist to the extreme now speaks about, well, protecting the EU single market from unfair competition. You didn't hear them saying that much, uh, that we need to relocalize uh, uh, critical industry components into the European Union. In other terms, takes a more critical stance towards all out globalization. So you, you can feel that even at policy level, uh, there's change. You, you can even have the president of the council, can you imagine? I mean, uh, Charles Michel used to be the prime minister of a neoliberal government in Belgium, and you have the same Charles Michel presenting the uh, agreement of the European Council on the budget and recovery plan, who finishes by saying, well, you know, we have been obsessed the last 30 years by growth. But actually, when you think in terms of well-being, you realize that what is important for well-being is a good health, it's a good uh, social uh, uh, cohesion, it is quality public services, and you come to think, hang on one second, who is saying that? A former prime minister who was totally neoliberal? So maybe you may question the sincerity of all this, but the thing is that leaders like him, or like Ursula von der Leyen, who has no past in green policies, have found it the right thing to say. And if they feel that this is the right thing to say, 
It is because they sense that public opinion is moving. And that is what, uh, what uh, gives me energy, because I, I do think that the, uh, the global pandemic has actually made intensified the request, the demand for change from our societies, and not necessarily change for a more uh, economy-driven society, not necessarily change towards a more authoritarian society, not necessarily uh, uh, change towards a society of more discrimination to the contrary. Actually, the fact that we are now living under severe restrictions of civil liberties because of the pandemic, well, in a way, it gives a taste of what it is to be deprived of liberty. And so increases the demand for it. So actually, what I do sense is that the, the ground has been shifting deeply in society and that uh, those mainstream neoliberals are losing the uh, cultural hegemony. They are no longer the ones being a priori considered as the rationals, the realists, the people uh, who, uh, who can manage. Actually, they increasingly appear as out of touch with reality. And the national populists are not being perceived as being more in touch with reality. Well, actually, they can when they ride the wave of anger, the wave of conspiracy theories. Of course they do. But we cannot say that all societies as a whole have been mesmerized by the, the, this approach. Absolutely not. And, and, and testament of that, I think, is also the green wave that is continuing. I mean, when citizens have the possibility to vote, well, they seem to give uh, Greens a bigger share of their trust. And that makes me rejoice. So I'm not saying now we have won the battle. I'm just saying that the window of opportunity to win the battle for the uh, ecological and socially just transition is increasing. In other terms, I would say that the pandemic has opened doors that were up until now locked three times over. Now, it's not because you open a door that society goes that way, but at least the door is no longer locked. So the opportunity to drive society to choose actually uh, to go for a more resilient, more just, more democratic, uh, more sustainable society. Well, the drive towards that uh, is stronger in society. And that is, I would say, not yet the, the heure de vérité, I would say, because my sense is that the window of opportunity for change after a big crisis is between 12 and 18 months. So we are not, here, not yet at the end of the crisis. Uh, but I do believe that the chance for Europe to take, well, say, to embrace the transition has never been highest. highest. And again, uh, just, and I'll finish with that, when we discussed one of the, the tough, well, big victories of the Greens in the uh, budget negotiation uh, was this biodiversity target. Because by and large, having strong climate targets is becoming accepted. You know, even the council wanted 30% of the budget and the recovery plan uh, be, um, be dedicated to that. Uh, but biodiversity is another battle. And I can tell you that resistance towards setting binding, legally binding uh, climate and biodiversity targets, resistance to that was and remains very strong in the European Commission, in the finance ministries of all the member states, and in the mainstream establishment. Because they would say, trust the market to do the right thing, give the right incentives, and everything will be fine. No, we are saying we are going to be more directive as to public spending. Well, you know, uh, of course, we fought a lot to, to, to win that. But at the end of the day, the person who gave instruction to the commission services and the concerned commissioner to accept that demand was no less than the commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, because she believes that we need change. She really believes it. She has invested 100% of her political capital into this European Green Deal, and she intends for it to be a success. And there, that, that is a sea change. I mean, Jean-Claude Juncker couldn't care less. And for her, it is her cause sacré. And therefore, uh, no, we cannot yet say that now we have put Europe on track uh, of a very different uh, society uh, in positive terms. So we are not there yet. But actually, the chance uh, for us achieving that are rising by the day. 
Okay, many thanks. And what you say reminds me of what's always the neoliberals said, like Milton Friedman, if there's a crisis, you need a plan to be able to change society. So we could say at this moment, there is a plan uh, at the European level. We have the Green Deal already uh, discussed many months. We have the recovery plan. But what you say about van der Leyen, and I think this also is interesting to what the experience of, I think, Jean in the UK today, Boris Johnson launched a very ambitious uh, climate policy plan. Oh, looks like very ambitious, let's be. And so how is it for Greens to face this challenge that suddenly there's not Juncker anymore, which was easily uh, to criticize him, uh, business as usual, neoliberal. Now we have uh, social democrats, Christian democrats, uh, and uh, I don't know in which field you want to place Boris Johnson. <laughs> neoliberal is maybe the safest neoliberal populist. Uh, yeah, announcing, approving uh, plans that some years before only the Greens would uh, propose. In what kind of position does that uh, put us in the political uh, game? Maybe, Jean, you can start from the UK perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it it is a it's a difficult question, you know, you it, to some extent. But on the other hand, I think it's something. First of all, we should say good, and then you raise the bar: Is this going to work? What is it that you are still doing that undermines what you are proclaiming here? You know, if you still have a huge road budget, which is bigger than your budget for any energy efficiency. And you know, changing heating systems in houses, you, you know, sort yourself out. You know, we now need policy coherence from those parties, and that's part of the challenge. I think it's also evidence, however, of the fact that Greens, um, people who have voted for us, people who have supported us, and those we have worked with in other parties, are actually changing the agenda. And that, you know, and that that's something that we should be very proud of. It's taken maybe longer, well, not maybe, it has taken longer than we wanted. But, you know, we have been the people who have been pushing this. We have been the people who have been working with others to actually move this forward in the political sphere. I mean, it's not only our progress, you, you know, and I think that obviously a huge amount of work has been going on the latest boost has come i think from fridays for future for a future um you, you know but it it's it is it is progress and therefore we should claim it as progress and now the the yeah now that we move to a different field it's about what are the best ways forward policy coherence what's really going to work what gets us the fastest possible change um, in a way that we won't regret because there have been some things that we've done in the past where you look at them and think, well, maybe that wasn't quite so successful. But, you know, and then let's put in place the what needs to happen along with it. And that, that really is quite a deep-seated change. And, I mean, within the education system, for example, I used to teach. That's where I go to. But, you know, there is still a lot more there to be done. That If you're looking at... What do we need now in terms of the skill, the space to make this happen? There is still a huge amount of work to be done on that. Um, you, you know, as I said, the investment side of it and making it work internationally. But we're now moving, you know, there's a real opportunity, as Philippe said, we're moving now to the next to the next level. Um, and the, so some the arguments now are about how, not if we need to do this. Okay, thanks. And also for you, Philip, this question, are we now in a new position as Greens? Uh, if you see that other political parties are partly taking over our agenda? Well, if they do, I welcome this, uh, because uh, it's not like anyone is the owner of, uh, of the uh, challenge of uh, transforming our societies. And well, we will need more than parties like ours who represent 10% uh, of the European electorate to, uh, to win. So, of course, when we uh, won on biodiversity and, um, 
and the climate uh, uh, quotas in the budget is because, well, the majority of the European Parliament supports this. Uh, and I, I do welcome that. Now, it's also the same people who support the free trade agreements with Vietnam and uh, uh, potentially with Mercosur and all the rest of it. Huh? So, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as you said, Jean, what we need is coherence. And uh, we are still far from it. And I would also acknowledge the key role that the Fridays for Future played. That's obvious. I mean, why is it that um, despite the fact that since the 70s, the scientific community is alerting us to global warming, why is it that now Ursula von der Leyen, who again is a really socially driven Christian Democrat, but not really uh, with, a, with a track record on green issues, how is it that she makes the European Green Deal the cornerstone of her policy for five years? Well, because I think that the Fridays for Future contributed a lot to make her aware of the urgency. And of course, she has kids and grandkids, and therefore that plays a role. But so, of course, I mean, what should I say? We are change makers in the political system, but we cannot work and win without the change makers in society. And let's, add, let, let, let's rejoice uh, uh, with the fact that uh, Fridays for Future are still playing uh, a very important role. I mean, uh, uh, people like, uh, like uh, Greta, like uh, Anuna or, or, or Adelaide Charlier are being uh, uh, met with uh, by uh, the, 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 the Merkels, the Timmermans, the von der Leyen, the, 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 the Contes of this world. Not, not always with very concrete results, but at least uh, we are becoming, uh, uh, I would say, mainstream. And actually, the, the power of the Greens is not so much the 10% that we hold, it is the fact that we are recognized by society as, um, how should I say, those who deliver the quality label on green policies. I mean, we are, and rightfully so, perceived as those who, if they say yes, then probably this policy is green enough. But if they say no, like we did on the cap, that means that this is, this is not good enough. So we have, of course, to be very careful in the way we use this sort of uh, confirmation stamp, because if we do it on the cheap, we lose, we lose it. It's like a consumer union, if it starts rating products very well, while the, the customer experience is very bad, then they lose all credibility. Same thing with us. But we are perceived as the ones who can deliver the label of this is the real thing. And this is why all votes are coveted in the European Parliament. And, and they were not before. Because indeed, as you said, uh, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, Liberals want to appear green. And maybe some of them want to make us redundant. But they also know that in order to come across as greens, they need the endorsement of the real thing. And so we are using that lever, which is quite powerful, to uh, to have an impact on policy and you know uh, we've always been like this but we have always punched above our weight but even more so today even more so today and i would say that we are becoming attractive uh, for new political forces as a political family so so this is a bit uh, all place on the on the uh, uh, in the landscape it's uh, very relevant that you both mentioned uh, Fridays for Future. I think this is a new force uh, in civil society. And discussing uh, civil society, what I found very uh, interesting is that the debate on the cap was not just a debate in the parliament or in the institutions. Uh, NGOs all over uh, Europe really tried to do their best to make it a part of a public debate. Yeah, but too late. I had the sense this was something, well, let's say new, we have we have had it before, but this was really something uh, motivating. Uh, did you sense that also in, in the parliament? Yes, but as I said, too late. I mean, this came way too late. Actually, the right thing to do, and that was one of the reasons why we voted against uh, von der Leyen and we abstained on the commission. We said, okay, European Green Deal is all good and well, but there's two major European policies where actually it's almost exclusive competence of the of the European Union, common agricultural policy and trade policy, which are totally uh, uh, not in line with the European Green Deal. You have to fix this. 
if you want your green deal to be credible and the right thing to do when she she came uh, to be confirmed as a, as a commission president was to withdraw the proposal of the uh, uh, Juncker commission on the cap in order for it to be reworked and aligned with the green deal and she she uh, shied away from doing that so she let the former pro proposal to run uh, uh, its course but then as with the expected result and actually the pressure of civil society should have been as it is now to withdraw the proposal but not now not after the vote in the parliament and in the council it should have been well a year before the vote so that indeed no one would lose face well except juncker but he was not no longer there uh, uh, and and then well we would have wait, wasted a little time reworking that proposal but at least we would have had a chance of having a cap aligned with the Green Deal. I would say that the mobilization came too late. Uh, by that time, uh, the, the, this was water under the bridge. And so we are going to use the leverage of the climate and biodiversity targets, binding targets in MFF, uh, in the, in the multi-annual budget to actually uh, drive a revision of the cap because there's no way you will be able to reach those targets without with the current cap. Okay, uh, maybe we should uh, discuss uh, the current situation of this week, uh, the veto from uh, Hungary and Poland. Uh, you could say as a joke, we are getting rid of uh, Trump. How can we get rid of Orban? But won't be very easy. Uh, so how, any idea how this is going to turn out? Because of the, as you know, there, there's a lot of, funding for these countries involved so they're punishing their own population yeah well there well first i would uh, i would say that it's not a matter of getting rid of orban because well using that kind of language feeds into his narrative uh, actually it's the hungarian people who put orban where he is and gave him a two uh, uh, a two-thirds majority and only the hungarian people can choose other leaders now, of course, you want a level playing field for opposition forces. You want a free press. And indeed, Orban has made it more difficult for democratic opposition to do its job, actually. And that is really worrying. So indeed, there we have to use leverage from the European Union. And I, I know that Orban wants to portray this as the new Soviet Union. But I mean, European Union, no one forced Hungary to become part of it. No one. I mean, this was a free choice of Hungary. I do not think that in 1945, uh, Hungary chose the Warsaw Pact as uh, its option. So uh, uh, we didn't force anyone, but indeed, if you're a member, there's uh, benefits attached to that, and not only uh, economic solidarity, but that's, of course, a significant part of it, but there's also obligations. Now, are we going to win uh, this, uh, this battle? I hope so. It will. Uh, it pretty much depends now on the European Council because uh, Parliament has given its agreement. So we have a deal that has a majority in the Council uh, and a very big majority at that. Uh, and now it's for the Council to find ways to uh, uh, to get the necessary assent of the Hungary and Poland in the areas where unanimity is needed. Uh, I don't know whether they, they will succeed, but what is at stake is the uh, European recovery plan. And I really insist that this is a groundbreaking plan. Uh, we are going to borrow together in order to spend together. Um, and that has uh, seldom been done and never to that extent in the, in the past of the European Union. So if they stand in the way uh, of that, uh, well, we will need to find other options to, uh, to do that. But we cannot go on with the European Union where we have member states not abiding by the obligations they have subscribed to by accessing the European Union, uh, blocking the, the whole thing. And I know that Orban can say, well, it is the democratic choice of Hungary uh, to be against migrants. It is the democratic choice of Poland uh, to have a constitutional court that is totally submitted to the, uh, to the executive branch. Uh, they can say that. Uh, but then if that is the, the case, then they have no place in the European Union. Yet I do believe that the majority of the people in Hungary and Poland want to be part of the European Union. If, if they had a choice between uh, meeting the access conditions of the EU today 
and being a member and not meeting them and being out, I have no doubt that the majority of citizens in Poland and Hungary would make the choice to be member and abide by the rules of the club. I have no doubt about that. So we have to win that debate uh, in those countries, in those countries. And that is where, indeed, I know the EGP is sparing no effort to, uh, to boost our, our, our friends in, uh, in the countries. And I know that we are portrayed as agents, foreign agents, you know. Actually, who is looking the most like Soviet Union today? Is it Brussels or is it the way power is being uh, captured by the autocrats in Hungary and in Poland? Well, I think uh, people know the answer. They look more and more like the former Soviet Union. By the way, it tells me who, uh, who uh, Orban restricts most as a, as, a, as a leader, Vladimir Putin, who was uh, 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 one of the agents of the of the communist uh, uh, secret service. So, so the, well, give me a break when you speak about Brussels being the new Soviet Union. This is just hilarious, hilarious. Okay, thanks. We have a question in Q and A, um, which is a question for both. This is written here. Given the foreseeable rise in inequality due to the current crisis, how can we truly ensure? that the most marginalized in our societies will benefit from the recovery plan. So will the recovery plan really be focused on the people most in need? Gene, um. you want to have a go at it? Yeah, let's... Um, I mean... It... There are there are so many ways in which you can actually, I, I think, use the potential of the recovery plan and the other mechanisms and, and legislation that's there to actually work with the most marginalised. And I think also one of the areas about marginalised um, people too that we knew about before the crisis that we are seeing during this corona crisis is also has a relationship um, to what's happening on migration. Um, and issues around those with no recourse to public funds and um, seasonal workers too. So I, I think, you know, that's one of the areas as well that, you know, needs needs attention. There's legislation on seasonal workers. Use that, implement it, actually make sure that people have access to health care when they need it, because this is an investment in the health of society as, as a whole. I think part of it is um, not just how the, it's the decisions about how the money is spent. And there, I think there is the argument, and we've said this, as, um, you know, Greens in the European Parliament about the um, recovery plans, you know, from the 2008 crisis, is the need for the engagement, not just of governments in making decisions about how the money is spent, but for Parliament, social partners, civil society to also have a role within that and to actually scrutinize the as it were the plans and to see whether they actually are fit for purpose so that that sort of transparency about what is being asked for in terms of funding i think is is critical and of course also the the role there that's being played by local authorities because they're often the people who have to deliver on the, the decisions that, that governments make, the European Union makes. So that is one of them. Um, then also how, you, you know, we're looking at, um, I suppose, the in terms of the questions that are asked about the particular projects, the, the target groups, um, et cetera, and to see what are the accompanying measures that are going to go along with um, you know, the particular spending, whether that's the reworking, you, you know, of the fund for the materially deprived, you, you know, those sort of elements. What are the things that go alongside that so that you're not just sticking, using sticking plaster, you're actually looking at that wider support change. And this is where some of the questions too about, you know, how is procurement policy being used to actually um, support businesses, uh, to support local economies in line with the rules? Do the rules need changing? So it's also the accompanying measures, not just what is actually within um, the recovery plans. 
and to make sure that those recovery plans are actually targeted on where they need to go and that we're not just going back to sort of, you know, some of the, the bad things that we know from the past where you're plowing money into um, regions that are politically important for you rather than the regions that actually need the money. So I think there are those sorts of elements within the EU recovery plan that are really important. It's, you know, okay, the rules that are there um, within what can the money be spent on, but what are the accompanying measures? How are we really going to see that you are looking at that wider change so that you're not just having to spend money in the same places on the same things two or three years down the line? And this is where sort of proposals also like um, the minimum wage directive come in, because again, you know, what are the things that are going in to support those that are mar most um, most marginalised within society? And also, how does it sit alongside the Roma strategy? How does it sit alongside other equality strategies that you have? And indeed, where does it fit with poverty reduction? If I may add, again, we are not the Soviet Union. We are not a centralised state. We are not even a federal state. Uh, we are uh, an embryo of uh, transnational democracy and the European Union can decide on this recovery plan and indeed we are going to attach a number of conditions to it, but actually most of the conditions are green uh, in terms of investments, but on, on, uh, on socially driven spending, uh, the choices will need to be made by the member states, uh, as uh, Jean indicated, and there uh, the pressure will need to be exerted in the, in the various capitals because uh, again, when you look at uh, France, for instance, this is still a pretty neoliberal government uh, believing in supply side economics. And so they believe that most of the recovery plan has to go to uh, fund uh, uh, companies uh, without many strings attached, by the way, uh, because they are still in this blind belief that what is good for business is good for society. Uh, and that uh, basically you reduce inequality because business is going well, which is uh, which is well, to be uh, to be uh, to be uh, kind, uh, quite a lunacy, right? Uh, but but anyway, uh, so we can we can put some conditions, but again, social policy is pretty much a national prerogative, and uh, it is then for the political balance in the member states to decide how, how the money will be allocated. Uh, I'm sure that the European Union will not stand in the way of uh, spending the, uh, the money in order to reduce uh, inequality in society. I'm sure that there, there won't be any obstacles in Brussels, but there needs to be political will in the member states. So you gave the example of France, where they will just use the money probably for neoliberal policies. Are there countries showing that another policy is possible um, using this money? Well, uh, I think that indeed uh, uh, countries more in the south uh, uh, will have a more balanced approach, even though uh, don't uh, well, I don't consider the the, the, the social democrats in Spain or or or, uh, or Italy to be very left wing. But uh, well, compared with Macron, they are probably a bit uh, a bit more on the on the social side. Uh, well, it's not a, a very high uh, threshold, of course, but uh, but. Uh, well, it, it can be uh, done in a better way. So, but again, what, what needs to be done is invest. And invest doesn't mean necessarily brick and mortar. Uh, invest in education, invest in social cohesion. I mean, I'm fed up of uh, this neoliberal kind of uh, worldview that's, that basically uh, sees social policy as a burden. You know, uh, that's, the, that's uh, the, the terms that they use, uh, that you can only uh, carry if you're prosperous, whether our view is that actually social cohesion, health, education are conditions of prosperity. Actually, if you want prosperity in the first place, well, you need all those components. These are not the rewards of prosperity. They are the conditions of prosperity. So when you invest in social cohesion, when you invest in education, when you invest in health, actually it gives more opportunities to, for a prosperous society. And so, uh, so, so our, our worldview is completely different. It's not okay. Well, give more chances to business tigers to create wealth and then we will distribute it. Actually, these so-called entrepreneurs, few of them deserve that name, 
uh, actually can only uh, create wealth in a society that gives them opportunities for creating wealth that is uh, good people, good uh, uh, social cohesion systems, good infrastructures, and all the rest of it. And who produces that? You know, this is uh, the, the, the public authorities who are producing that by democratic choice and not uh, uh, private companies. I, I'm not saying that they don't play any role in that. I'm just saying that, well, basically feed the economy, feed the beast, and then everyone will be fine. Well, this is indeed uh, uh, just a distortion of reality, fake news. So that's clear. We need another beast. <laughs> if you call, I'm not sure we need the beast. We need uh, we need biodiversity in society. We yeah. we we do not want big beasts, you know. Uh, as greens, uh, uh, we want a diverse uh, society with all forms of living beings. Uh, we believe that this is much more resilient than having one big beast instead of, the, of another big beast. I think this is indeed is a, a, a key dimension of resilience, eh? whether it's in nature or in the economy, is this kind of diversity, this mixed economy with different kind of economic players, also public services play a crucial role. Uh, that's clear. Well, we are almost ending this uh, talk and uh, Jean, I know it's always a kind of uh, difficult question, but we are in the last weeks before the Brexit, so I cannot other than uh, ask your opinion. <laughs> it's an impossible uh, question, but what do you think uh, the, what can happen in the coming days? Do you think Johnson with his new people around him will change course? I would love to say yes, but I think the answer is no. I think that, you know, from everything that we hear, he seems to be the main driver of, you know, you hold the line, you hold the line. Um, you, regardless of what else you're seeing, we were seeing sort of just within the last few days, you, you know, people from the, the fisheries sector waking up to, oh, my God, it's going to take us longer to export, um, you, you know, our product to to Europe the rest of Europe, it's going to be more expensive, it's going to be more difficult. And you're thinking, you, you know, it, it, it reminds me, this will sound like a very sort of a bizarre comparison. But when I was teaching, it was like one of these things about, you, you know, when you were teaching sex education, and everybody thought sort of, oh, my God, everybody is really going to take this on board and understand it. And then you realise that people take it on at the point where it becomes relevant to them. And suddenly, you know, here's the fisheries industry. Oh, my God, Brexit is not good for us. And yet we're holding out over fish that don't have passports anyway. So, I, you know, I think January the 1st is, is going to be difficult. I mean, it be difficult for those from the European Union trading with us, but certainly difficult for us. And I think there are still some people who seem to think that because we have the pandemic going on, that this will actually mask a number of the effects of Brexit, and that that will be one of the few positives, few positives, you, you know, with the pandemic. But no, we are not really prepared. We still don't know what we're doing. We still don't have a deal. You know, European Parliament has to vote on this. I mean, it is as much a mess as it has been throughout the entire process. And it is heartbreaking. I think uh, we can agree, and maybe Philip, can we say the, the European Union is ready for the Brexit, if it's necessary, if it's there? Well, uh, you're never ready for such things, so it, indeed uh, it's heartbreaking, and we know it's going to be difficult, because even if there's an agreement, there will be massive disruption, because uh, the agreement won't be very, very uh, deep, it's going to be a uh, a shallow agreement between uh, between the European Union and the United Kingdom. It didn't need to be that way, but I must say that the English nationalists uh, uh, have pretty much won the capture the the, the the power in the UK. Now I don't know uh, because well Johnson kicked out uh, uh, Cummings and Co uh, from his uh, closest uh, circle of advisors. Is this meant to clear the way for more conciliatory? Uh, approach well the the feedback i'm getting from the negotiators is that so far it didn't translate into a change of attitude 
uh, and the key issues and fisheries is is very high symbolically, but very small economically. Uh, but the key issues about the uh, integrity of the single market, from our view, that is linking market access to uh, basically uh, uh, not undercutting EU legislation. Uh, this Gordian knot remains uh, still pretty much intact. And uh, well, there's no. How should I say? You cannot fool around with this. I mean, uh, uh, market access pretty much depends on regulatory alignment. So the more market access you want, the more regulatory alignment uh, you need to have. And that indeed restricts your ability to legislate. That's just fact of life. You may want total political independence to legislate any way you like. But then, of course, your market access will be uh, uh, reduced uh, 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 in accordance with that. And uh, as, as we said from the outset, you can't uh, have your cake and eat it. That's true for the United Kingdom. It's also true for the European Union. Uh, so compromises need to be made. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, the, the prime minister, because ultimately it boils down to one person. Uh, it's, uh, it's really Johnson calling the shots. Will he make an opportunistic choice? And you know, a year ago, uh, he, he, he won the election basically saying that Theresa May had completely uh, 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 well sold out the United Kingdom to the European interest, and he would take up the negotiation and negotiate a much better deal. And he did. It was a much better deal for the European Union. He did. But he presented it as a much better deal for the UK. So the, that person is a bit Trump-like, you know. He can basically say, I made the sun round. What a wonderful victory. I mean, if people want to believe that, fine. Now, he may decide ultimately to accept a form of uh, restriction to the ability of his government or of his parliament to legislate uh, in the sense of keeping a degree of alignment with the European Union and sell that as a, uh, as a big victory. Fine by me. I mean, I do not care about the packing of the deal. What interests me is what is in uh, inside the deal. And if the inside uh, preserves the integrity of the single market and reduces disruption to the least, to, to the bare minimum on January 1st, uh, fine by me. And he can call that any way he likes. I really don't care. Okay, thanks. Um... This makes clear that whether we're talking about uh, the multi-annual budget or we're talking about the recovery plan with the veto of the two countries and we're talking about the Brexit, the coming weeks will be crucial, I think, for uh, the future of the European Union. And so we can only cross our fingers that we move towards uh, a more democratic and, and sustainable Europe. I want to thank you both. I know you're both very busy people. So many thanks for your insights and uh, also the public at home. Thank you very much for your questions and your attention. And uh, if you appreciate these Green Post Corner Talks, you can also give a donation to the Green European Foundation and you can find now the information in the chat box. So many thanks and have